take your Bibles if you would. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We will suspend our study in Matthew until after the Christmas holiday. And we will be studying scriptures related to the coming of Christ, the Advent preparing for that coming. I need to tell you an old, old story to lead up to the scripture we're going to read today. Back in the span of what we as human beings know as time, there came a point where God began to put into action his plan for a little speck in space called Earth. He took that little speck that was without form and void and he began to speak to it. And in that he created all that we see and understand about what we call nature. He formed the earth. He made it a beautiful living habitat for mankind. He created all of the animals that we see and know. Some maybe we haven't seen. When people talk about dinosaurs, I've heard at least a couple of preachers say there was never anything such as a dinosaur that Satan only created the bones and stuff to fool mankind. <laughs> and yet scripture talks about, behold the behemoth. Yes. And it even speaks in a way that the behemoth has hot breath, known as dragon fire. Y'all didn't, did y'all know that was scriptural? It's there. And he created all these things and in the midst of it, he created a garden. The most beautiful, the most special, the most perfect garden that there has ever been. The most beautiful flowers. The most beautiful fruit. You know, today when we go to the grocery store and we want to buy fruit, I've watched my wife do this. She'll take the fruit, she'll look at it, She'll squeeze it a little bit. She'll smell it. She wants to make sure she's getting the best fruit that there is. Personally, I know how to thump a watermelon. Uh, but we do those things looking to make sure we get the good fruit, don't we? Did you know in the Garden of Eden there was no bad fruit? That no matter which piece you picked, it was perfect? It was luscious. It was delicious. There was literally nothing bad in the Garden of Eden. And he planted man there. And did you know from the beginning that man had responsibility? Man was to keep the garden. Adam, the man, had to name the animals. Uh, it's, just, it's just amazing the process that took place. There was one restriction in the garden. There was a tree whose fruit brought the knowledge of good and evil. God said, do not partake of that tree. He created a woman to be a helpmate unto Adam. And in that duo, they ended up going against what God had said. By the way, God had made a very dire prediction. He said, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. Some people read that and they want to say, see, it's a lie. They didn't die. They lived afterwards. They did die that day. Their spirit died. 
a connection with God was severed. And then what happened? Genesis 3, verse 8. By the way, let me tell this part of the story also. Once they ate of the fruit, they realized they were naked. They took and sewed together fig leaves to try to hide their nakedness. Verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Every time I read this, I remind you, the question was not because God did not know where they were. The question was because Adam didn't know where he was. Well, sure he did. He was hiding behind the tree, behind the big tree, so God couldn't see him. That's not what I'm saying. Spiritually, a transition had taken place. And Adam didn't realize that he had died spiritually the moment he partook of what we call the forbidden fruit. And by the way, to the best of my knowledge, the Bible doesn't say it was an apple and the Bible doesn't say it was a tomato. We don't know what it was. And I'll tell you, it's not the fruit that we know today. And I believe that with all my heart. It's different than those things. So they hid among the trees and God said, where art thou? Verse 10, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, God said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldn't, shouldst eat? The man said, the woman who thou gavest to be with me she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And by the way, God did not create woman as your helpmate to be the one that you get to blame for everything, gentlemen. You see, God held Adam responsible because he was the responsible party among the two. And by the way, if you ever want to talk about it, I believe the man of the house is still supposed to be the responsible party. That's the way God set it up. If that doesn't fit your, your understanding of a marriage, then you need to talk to God about it. Yes. But there's no question what God said. The woman thou gave us to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Did you notice in this story that nobody's guilty? It's always somebody else. It's always some other circumstance. That has become what is known today as psychology and psychiatry to a great degree. Is there some knowledge in those sciences? Yes, there are. But in many of them, they help you to blame somebody else for where you are and they deal with how you can deal with that person and get over what they did to you. The picture here is that man made choices that separated them from God. Verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, Above every beast of the field, upon the belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. He's talking to the serpent. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is the first scripture that talks about the coming of Jesus. Amen. Jesus was going to bruise the head of the serpent. And the serpent bruised the heel of Jesus. 16. The woman 
Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And the desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Whoa. Surely God didn't mean that. Well, we'll study that further one of these days and you'll find what it means. The New Testament helps explain that. But the Father is to be the head of the house. And you who are fathers and husbands, you are responsible for the spiritual condition of the house in which you live. And God will hold you responsible for that. I'm going to skip now to verse uh, 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. That's talking about Adam. He sent him out. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I've heard some people foolishly say, well, if we could find the Garden of Eden, we could find the tree of life. No, you can't. <laughs> it's protected. That's right. To this very day, you can't show me a scripture where it has become available. It's still protected. So God uh, cast the man out of the garden that was created for him specifically, made perfect for him. Now before people start wondering, I'll tell you, over the next month I'll also be using a guide for Advent. And I'll tell you why. It's much easier than me transposing all the outlines on a piece of paper. I'll just tell you what I'm doing. That way you know. The first day of Advent in this study talks about something that most people never give thought to. The lost presence. As you read in the first chapters, of Genesis, you find that God is walking and talking with mankind. But when they sinned, that relationship changed. When they sinned, that communication was broken. The last thing that they had where God walked and talked with them was when God cast them out of the garden. Since that time, you don't have that relationship such as they had in the garden. There's a presence of God that was lost and has not been restored yet. Doesn't mean that God on occasion did not have contact with man. But every time he did from this place on, it's not God the Father, it's Jesus the Son. Mm -hmm. Amen. What is known as theophanies. Many times when you read the word angel there in the Old Testament, you study the context, you realize it's talking about God. In that case, it's Jesus, the revelation of God to man. Amen. The revelation of God to man all the way from the moment they were cast out of the garden until today. He is still the revelation of God to man. God banished him from the Garden of Eden. Now you can turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I, uh, 
could do this very quickly, but you don't get the whole picture unless you read beginning in verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Other people have translated that differently. One of the more popular other translations says, and the Word was a God. Mm -mm. Can't be. That's right. God has declared there's no gods before Him, beside Him, or after Him. Amen. And some people say, well, that means God's going to end. No, it doesn't. It means there's just no chance of there being another God. Amen. Throughout time, as man knows it, there will be only one God. Then people say, well, see, that means that Jesus wasn't really God. This says He is. He was with God and He was God. And if you want to fully understand that, you talk to God about it when you leave this life and you go to be with Him as a child of God. <laughs> the same was in the beginning with God. So verse 1 and 2 are directly, directly related to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They're tied together. You can't separate them. It declares the glory of God. It declares the glory of Jesus, who is God. That's right. Verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The subject of all of these verses is Jesus. Yes. All things that were made were made by Jesus. At the same time, God the Father has said that all these things were made for Jesus. Interesting stuff. Yes. Verse 4. In Him, who? Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. Amen. You have a choice in life. Darkness or light? Darkness or light? Everybody here knows people that are living in darkness. Yes, yes. Every one of you knows someone that's living in darkness. Some worse than others, some deeper than others. I talk about this often in messages that it's wonderful to meet someone and there's immediately a bond between you and them because in your spirit you sense the spirit of God in them. There's an instant bond of brotherhood, sisterhood in that relationship with God. Verse 5, And the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light and all men through him, that all men through him might believe. Amen. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. He was not the light. Jesus was. Amen. But John was the one that was the forebearer. He began the ministry leading up to the end, the conception of Jesus, the appearance of Jesus. He began preaching, repent and be baptized. Now I do not want you to get messed up on that. Repent and baptize that John taught is not the same of repent and be baptized that we teach today. Amen. This is before the death of Christ. Baptism does not cleanse you from sin. Amen. There are groups that claim it doesn't. I go back to the old teaching and people say, well, that's just an exception. But there are men recorded in Scripture that were not baptized. The main one is the thief on the cross. And God said, Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. Yeah. And he was never baptized. Listen. Let me give you the true picture. They did not stop the crucifixion and Jesus would get down and they got water and baptized the thief and then get back up on the cross. 
Okay? The thief was not baptized. And he went to heaven. Or in that period of time, he went to paradise. It wasn't long after that he was actually in heaven. Verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Notice that. This is important for all that we teach during the Christmas season. This says the light of God has been shown to every man. You don't see an asterisk there. You don't see an addendum there. You don't see it except there. It says every man. Read Romans 1. Romans 1 makes it very clear that there is evidence enough of God that every man can choose to look to find out who that God is. If you've never thought about this before, all other religions began with somebody looking for God. And every man that truly is looking for the only true and living God God will provide a way for them to know the truth. He will. But many who were looking weren't looking for the true God. Any God would do for them. And so they chose darkness. Please hear me. Despite what the Baha'i faith teaches, all other religions that do not glorify Jesus as God are false religions. Amen. False religions are darkness. Mm -hmm. yes. Understand this. It's amazing how wonderful some of the dark religions look. Right. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, in the eyes of men, Mormons are good people. Yes. They teach Good, honest living. Yep. And yet they don't recognize who Jesus really is. Amen. And such a shame that is. Because it attracts people. Their goodness does. Oh, that God's true people would work to be as attractive to the world as they do. Well, how do we do that, preacher? Live the life that God's Word describes and prescribes for you. Amen. Just like you go to the doctor and get a prescription. The prescription for life is the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, teaching you the life of God, that you might share the light of God with the lost and dying world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Notice that. He created us, and there are many that don't recognize that. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Did you know that hurts? I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that or not. When I went south, Earlier in the fall, my Aunt Myrna Joyce made the best pot of gumbo she's probably ever made. And I enjoyed it, and she invited the family to come. But I knew who would come and who wouldn't. There were a couple that would have, but they couldn't. Physically, they can't. But others have no use for me. Understand that I broke the law, I got in trouble. I brought shame upon the family name, if you want to put it that way. And they can't see the change in me because they won't spend the time with me to find out. They have their opinion and they're going to stick with it. 
That's what the people in Jerusalem did. That's what the people in Bethany did. That's what all the people in Israel did as Jesus came. They either followed him or they totally, absolutely, unequivocally rejected him. Did you know you can't reject Jesus just a little bit? Amen. To say no to Jesus is absolute rejection. Came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. Full of truth. What was broken in the Garden of Eden, the depth of relationship with God, where He walked in the evening with Adam and Eve, that close relationship was broken when they sinned. And it's never been quite the same since. The lost presence. Mm -hmm. Now when you come to Christ, you believe He died for your sin. You believe He was buried in a grave and three days later He rose from the grave. You believe that. You trust that. And you ask Him for forgiveness of sin. And you ask Him to come into your life. There is reestablished that sweet relationship with God is not the fullness that it originally was. But the Spirit of God comes to dwell within you as a child of God. He's there to speak to you, to grow you, to teach you, to strengthen you, to impart wisdom to you. And as He does that, it's up to you to walk with Him. There's a commercial on TV right now that I absolutely love. I'm going to close with this example for today. Man's talking to a group of men and women. And the man says, I need you to help me move. And the guy he's talking to says, I'm busy that weekend. And the man who asked said, I didn't say which weekend. <laughs> Isn't that the way we are sometimes? How true that is. <laughs> God, I'm busy. How many times in the church have we said, I'd like to help, but I'm so busy. I'd like to do that. That's a good idea, but I'm too busy. Is what you're busy about the work in the kingdom of God or is what you're busy about the own desires of your heart? Understand what an amazing thing it was when Jesus left the glories of heaven and came down and took on the form of a man that he might be a servant to man. Did you ever consider that? You know, these stories about Jesus washing feet and healing and all these things he did. He was serving man when he did that. God taking the place of the lowest of servants for you and for me. As we said last week, faithful unto death, even the death of the cross. There is no resurrection Sunday without the birth of Christ. There is no restoration into the relationship with God without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There is no true church of God that denies the resurrection, that denies the burial, that denies the death on the cross. And yes, in case you don't know it, there are churches with steeples that have a cross on top of them 
They have a place for a pastor to stand and proclaim the word and they deny what the word says. God help us. Yeah. You hear that and many Christians go, oh, that's terrible. That's true. Yes. Every time you sin, you're guilty of doing the same thing those people are because when you sin, you are denying what God said is right and choosing what the devil says is right. And between those two choices, who's right? God or Satan? You know, even Saturday Night Live had skits that made people laugh. And they didn't realize that in what that Saturday Night Live was doing and what even I at one time were laughing at was denying the truth of God, making fun of the idea of Satan. The critics said that Saturday Night Live was, um, oh, I can't think of the word now, I had it a moment ago, irreverent. Mm -hmm. Irreverence yeah. is the opposite of reverence. It's taking truth and turning it into a lie. I'm way over time this morning, but you know what? You need to take the time to hear Amen. and to respond to God's call right. in your life. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the day and the blessings in it. Father, as we have just begun today, just scratch the surface of what we're going to teach over the next month. Help people to understand the truth, Father. Convict them of their need of a Savior. Reveal to them that they're lost and undone without Jesus in their lives. Help them, Father, to call upon the name of the Father as a result of the sacrifice of Jesus to ask for forgiveness of sins that the Holy Spirit may come into their life and teach them that they may trust in such a way and call upon the name of Jesus in such a way that they shall be saved I thank you Father for what you're going to do it's in that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.